All right, so let's pray. Dear God, we just um, we just want to come before you as as humbly as we know how, Father, with hearts of gratitude and thanks, Father. You've given us another day. Um, you've given us a breath in our lungs, Lord. Uh, and today we just have another opportunity to to get to know you, to open your word, and to to listen to your voice, Father. Lord, I pray, Lord, uh, just for these specific prayer requests. I thank you, Lord, that that you even hear our prayers, that you want to hear our prayers, that you want to answer our prayers, that you love us more than we can ever imagine or think, Lord. And as hard as these things are, um, and as difficult as it, as it is, even for me to hear it, Lord, there is nothing too difficult for you. Uh, you created each and every one of us, Father. You know every cell and bone in our body, Father. And one, with one word, we know that you have the power to heal. And that that, that still happens today, Father. I pray, Lord, for myself, uh, that you would heal me of, of my sickness as well. Um, I, I thank you, Lord, for the strength uh, that you've given to, to me, which is only by your grace, and to, any, to anyone else, to all of us, actually, every day. We, we live and move and we have our being only because of you, Father. So now as we read and we study your word, <clears throat> I just ask you, Lord, to fill me with your spirit. Um, empty me of any selfish ambition that I might have. Fill each and every one of us with your spirit. Uh, may, may only your words and your message be spoken today, Lord. We just want to thank you and ensure that we give you all the glory, honor, and praise, regardless of, of what happens, Father. May your will be done. You know our hearts, and we know, we, we know you love us. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. 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 Well, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so... If you should be able to see Amos chapter 4 on the screen. The last time we met was uh, two weeks ago, and we went through Amos chapter 3. And as we get into Amos chapter 4, we're, we're going to continue to see this theme of God's judgment on Israel because of their sins. And like I did last time, I'm just going to go through, you know, verse by verse, maybe one or two verses at a time, and then discuss them. And then I'll open it up for any comments or questions people might have. So verse 1... <clears throat> Oh, by the way, this is the ESV. Uh, verse 1 reads, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring that we may drink. So, let me stop right there. Samaria essentially represents all of Israel. The mountain of Samaria represents the people in power in Israel. So this, is, this, this chapter starts off with a message specifically to the wives of the wealthy, the wives of the, the people who are the, the ruling men of Israel. Now today, you know, maybe you were thinking this as we were reading, like, like I did, if you call someone a cow today, that's obviously considered very disrespectful and very rude, right? But obviously this was a different time and a different culture. But nonetheless, God was still using this to make a very strong and powerful point. So the land of Bashan is where the uh, present-day Golan Heights are. And it had a, a very rich and fertile land with lots of cows grazing over all of the pastures in that land. And God is just pointing out the fact that these wives and these women were indulging themselves in selfish excess. So they're focused only on their own uh, cravings, what they what they hunger for, they're focused only on their own sensual desires. So essentially, he's saying they're very self-absorbed. But then uh, these women go even further. So they're they're not just overeating, but they're overeating at the expense of other people. Uh, remember, these are the wives of the husbands who are in the ruling class of Israel. So they are oppressing the poor. They are they are crushing the needy, and this is happening either directly or indirectly. And the wives are basically reaping the benefits of that, so they are complicit. Um, they are just as guilty as their husbands for these injustices. And most likely they are, based on the reading of this, it sounds like they're even just encouraging their husbands to just keep exploiting the poor so that they can have their drink, so they can live this lavish lifestyle and eat and have this life of leisure. Um, and these are the kinds of people we still see today that essentially believe that the world revolves around them. But God's kingdom <clears throat> operates in a completely different way. You know, God makes it clear in Romans 13, 1, that all authority, from the authority we have in a household to, to the authority a president or king might have over a country, all authority comes from God. And not only are we accountable for the authority that He has given to us, but to whom much is given, more will be required. That's what we read in Luke 12, 48. 
in God's kingdom, we're supposed to think of others as more highly than ourselves. As it says in Philippians 2.3, we're supposed to treat others the way we want to be treated. Luke 6.31, from, from whence we have the golden rule. Um, in God's kingdom, the first is, is the last, and the last is the first. Matthew 20.16. And even when you look at the law in the Old Testament, God gave the Israelites principles that ensured that the poor had dignity, that they had opportunities, and that they, they have justice. So, for example, when Ruth was gleaning in the fields with the poor, that was an example of the provisions from Leviticus 19.10, which says, And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And in Deuteronomy 15.12-15, to 15, we, we read how indentured servants were to be set free after six years of service. Not only were they to be set free, but, but they were to be given resources like flocks and, and other goods to help them get back on their feet. So it's just amazing to read that um, in the Old Testament. And in this one verse alone in Amos 4.1, you know, we can clearly see how far gone Israel had, had become from what God originally intended and instructed them to do. Now in verse 2 it says, the Lord God has sworn by His holiness that, Behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. So here, God, first of all, God swears on Himself. He swears on His holiness because nothing and no one is higher than Himself. He promises that these women will be taken away with hooks. And we all know what meat hooks in, in a freezer look like. That's, a, that's the image that I immediately got in my head. So they'll be taken away with meat hooks and even the last of them with fish hooks. So basically the way that meat or fish gets transported, these women will also either be killed or go into exile. And then verse 3 says, And you shall go out through the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you shall be cast out, of, out into Hormon, declares the Lord. So the breaches on a city's wall are basically the weak openings within the wall. They, they make a city vulnerable to invasion. So these women might feel safe, but we know that that feeling of safety was simply just a delusion. It's a sense of uh, what we would call false security. They're still going to go through these breaches and they're still going to be cast out. And again, it's like all the things that tend to bring us false security. Um, Jonas talked about this as well. Times of prosperity make us vulnerable to feeling self-sufficient. It makes us think uh, we earned it. It makes us think we are safe when in fact that the truth is everything apart from God is fleeting, it's temporary, um, and it, it could be taken away in a heartbeat. So, so this word, um, Harmon, is, is mentioned only once in the Bible, interestingly enough. And while scholars don't know for sure exactly what this refers to, uh, because there is no such place as Harmon, uh, what we do know is that essentially it represents a place of exile. It's a place where rather than being at the top, you're at the bottom and you're vulnerable to being exploited, you're vulnerable to abuse and to being treated harshly. And that's the danger really of placing our hopes and our security in the things of this world. Um, many times we've talked about in the past that, that nothing will truly satisfy us, nothing will fully uh, you know, save us and nothing will give us peace and security except for God. And in Psalms 57.1, David writes, In you, God, my soul takes refuge, in the shadow of your wings I take refuge until the storm of destruction pass by. And Psalm 91 is, is another psalm I'll mention. Uh, too long to read, but just another great psalm about God's protection and rescue. And the next part, uh, verse 4, when we read verse 4, it's actually said in sarcasm to the people of Israel. So I'm just going to read 4 and 5. Come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days, Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened, and proclaim free will offerings, publish them or proclaim them, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord. And I mentioned two weeks ago that uh, Bethel was one of the places King Jeroboam set up a golden calf. The other place was Dan. So King Jeroboam didn't want people going down to Judah to worship, so he set up these golden calves that you can read about in 1 Kings 12. And historically, be, be, before that, before it was desecrated, uh, Bethel was established as a place of worship. 
You know, Bethel is about uh, 10 miles north of Jerusalem. And that was the place, if you remember, where Jacob had the dream of angels ascending and descending on a ladder to heaven. And God reaffirms the Abrahamic covenant with, with Jacob. And Jacob sets up a pillar in this place. He makes a vow to God and he calls the place Bethel. And this, if you want to read about it, it's in Genesis 28, 10 to 22. Now Gilgal was another place. It was near Jericho. It was the first place that the children of Israel made camp after being delivered from Egypt and after they crossed the Jordan River uh, into the Promised Land. That's in Joshua 4.19. And this was where Joshua set up 12 stones from the Jordan River. And this was also the place where King Saul was anointed. So while Bethel represented a place of worship, Gilgal could be seen as representing uh, political authority, which is supposed to be under God's guidance and God's overall authority. And when we read verses 4 to 5, it is, it is clear that God, through Amos, is speaking sarcastically to the people. They are desecrating places that were previously holy. Their religion is no longer in truth, but now their sinful lifestyle is their religion. They're devout about their sins rather than being devout about God. And they are so dedicated to the things of the world when that dedication should have been reserved for God. And this also reminds us of... Um, the fact that our outward religious appearances mean nothing if it doesn't flow from a righteous, transformed heart. You know, we can bring our sacrifices of praise. We can tithe our 10%. We can shout praises to God and we can publicly, you know, serve and give stuff away. But scripture makes it clear time and time again that what matters is the heart. So I was thinking of all the places this is seen in scripture from Moses saying in Deuteronomy 10.16 that God is concerned about the circumcision of the, the foreskins of their hearts. So when, when Paul talks about heart circumcision, he didn't just make that up. That was all, already known from the time of Moses in Deuteronomy. And also to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, where he says, Hate is like murder. Lust is adultery. And in 1 Samuel 16.7, it says, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Jeremiah 17.10, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Acts 15.8, God knows the heart. So we might, we might be able to fool people, but we definitely can't fool God. And I know I, I probably mention this a lot, but I always think of Galatians 6, 7 to, to 8, which tells us, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he, will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So it's interesting how God is condemning their desire to justify their sins through outward practices and condemning them for their desire to be seen by other people. So verse 5, as I was saying, it says, Proclaim free will offerings, offerings publish them, or essentially saying, you know, keep showing off, keep making it known. And, and of course, this immediately reminds us of the Pharisees. In both cases, they wanted everyone around them to see how supposedly devout and good they were. But just to hammer the point one more time, it's all about what is on the inside, right? Jesus calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs in Matthew 23, 27 to 28, because they look so nice and clean on the outside, but they're dead and wicked and full of hypocrisy on the inside. So the next section, let me scroll down. The next section is titled, Israel has not returned to the Lord. <clears throat> In this section, God lays out um, a number of different things he did to try to get Israel's attention and to try to get them to turn back to him. So verse six, it says, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. So this one actually confused me at first, but I read that cleanness of teeth is, is an idiom for famine, which makes sense. You know, if you have nothing to eat, there's nothing dirty on your teeth, right? So this famine was in all their cities and in all their places, and yet they did not return to God. Verse 7, I also withheld the rain from you when there were yet three months to harvest, I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. One field would have rain and the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would, would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. So the next disaster or calamity that God brought up uh, to the people was drought. 
And God did this when there was still three months left until harvest time. In this drought, God would still allow rain uh, for one city when he would withhold it from other cities. So even the little that they received was not enough to satisfy everyone. And this kind of um, spotty or selective rainfall was extremely unusual. So it would have been clear to the people that this was divine, that God was trying to get their attention. In verse 9 it says, I struck you with blight and mildew, your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees and your olive trees the locusts devoured. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. So verse 9, it mentions the third and fourth disasters that God brought. So, so blight is a disease or injury to plants in which they form these lesions, they might wither, and parts of them could die. So some translations use the term scorching winds or blasting, uh, basically indicating that the hot east winds would blow for days at a time and injure these crops. And then mildew refers to a thin white coating consisting of a type of fungus. You probably are familiar, more familiar with this, possibly inf infecting the plants because, because of the injury that the winds caused them, which made them more vulnerable. The other disaster God brought on the people was locusts, and in some translations it actually says caterpillar. But the point is, uh, these locusts or caterpillars devoured the Israelite crops. It ate all their gardens, their fig trees, their olive trees, all of their vineyards, and still... They didn't get the message and they didn't return to, to God. Um, in verse 10, it says, I sent you a pestilence or a plague <clears throat> after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword and carried away your horses. And I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Again, uh, this one verse has two disasters in it. First, the language that, that is used here by God should have reminded the people of uh, very clearly of the plagues that God sent to Egypt. God used the plagues to try to get Pharaoh's attention and to get him to, to let go of his pride, right? And to yield to the one true God. And God's doing the same thing with Israel now. But unfortunately, just like Pharaoh, Israel did not listen and they would suffer even more for it. So the second disaster... Uh, in this verse is warfare, which killed their young men who were fighting. And it was so bad that the stench or the smell of their dead filled the entire Israelite camp. We talked about God being our refuge and, and our only safe place of security. So the people placed their hopes and security in material things, in, in their military power or other temporal things, in their walls. But now, now with their soldiers dead and with their horses taken, they are left without a defense. Then the last disaster that God uh, points out here in sense is verse 11. He says, I overthrew some of you as, as when God overthrew Saddam and Gomorrah and you were as a brand plucked, plucked out of the burning, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. So again, they would have known about the account of Saddam and Gomorrah, which we can read about now in Genesis 19. God divinely judged them for their wickedness uh, and, and for, their, for their wickedness in Israel to be compared to Saddam and Gomorrah, it says a lot in and of itself. But it also reminds me of what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew ten fourteen to 15, where he says, If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Saddam and Gomorrah than for that town. So to reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit is the only unforgivable sin, which we read about in Mark 3. We see it also in Matthew 12. And that makes sense because those who have rejected God do not seek forgiveness anyway. So God says he overthrew some of the Israelites, just like Saddam and Gomorrah, be it through these natural disasters, through the plague, or through foreign invasion. But those who survived were like a, a burning stick that was snatched out of the fire. So we know that fire represents judgment. But, but here it's showing that even some were, were still spared. Some were spared. And yet again, the people did not listen or, or turn back to God. So that phrase is interesting. It says, yet you did not return to me. And it's used five times. And I think this just shows the depths of Israel's sin and especially the depths of, of Israel's stubbornness. And then in verse 12, Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. 
So this reminded me of Job 38.3, where God tells Job to gird up his loins like a man, for he will, for God says, I will question you and I will seek an answer from you. Um, and just as God makes it clear to Job that he is far beyond Job in power, far beyond Job in wisdom, and in every other sense, God does the same thing to Israel. In Amos 4, verse 13, he says, For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind, and declares to man what is his thought. Who, you can read his mind, so, who makes the morning darkness and, and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. So, as I read this, again, just reminded that there is no one like our God. And, and that's what we mean when we call God holy. He is set apart. He's one of a kind. There's nothing in creation that is like him. And that's part of the reason we can't fully comprehend his triune nature. That's part of the reason why no analogy will ever work perfectly for the Trinity. But God is reminding them that people so easily forget, and this, inc this includes Christians, he's reminding them that people so easily forget who he is, that the fact that God's very nature demands respect and it demands reverence. And two weeks ago, uh, when we met, we spoke about how the Israelites feared when God's presence was made known. And the example we talked about was when Mount Sinai would be covered in smoke and it was shaking violently. And then I mentioned Psalm uh, 97, how the mountains melt like wax before the Lord. So given this and in light of this, it's, it's no question. God can't be manipulated. No matter how much we might think or su subconsciously think we can do that, uh, God cannot be manipulated. This all-powerful and holy God who is perfect in every single way, he has to judge sin. People uh, tend to have this idea that God should just be accepting of everyone, or if he has, or, if, or on the flip side, if he has principles and rules that go against what might be politically correct, then he's a tyrant and hateful God. So this all stems from a misunderstanding of what love truly is. And everyone has their own definition of love, right? But only God represents what love truly is. The, the transcendent, perfect standard of goodness and righteousness and love is only found in God's nature. And that is the standard by which all things should be judged by. And God cannot be perfectly loving without also at the same time being perfectly just. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be loving to not hold uh, a murderer or a rapist accountable for their sins, right? And, and for the hurt that they've caused other people. It wouldn't be loving to allow others to keep living a lifestyle that we know will eventually lead to their destruction and to their death. If someone's uh, walking towards a door with fire on the other side and we don't warn them, that that is not loving. So at the same time, I also want to point out the fact that God's love includes both grace and forgiveness. So sin has consequences, but there is also forgiveness. And nothing better exemplifies this than the fact that God himself took on human flesh, Jesus Christ, and Jesus endured and took our punishment for us in order to satisfy the wrath and the justice of God. And all throughout scripture, there is judgment. We read this, but there is also hope that we read about. And in the next chapter, chapter 5 of Amos, God will appeal to the people to seek him and to live. If they seek him, they will live. And there's, there's still that hope for repentance and restoration. And that's exactly what the good news of the gospel is, right? It's reconciliation, renewal, and restoration. If only we would repent and turn away from sin and yield our lives to Christ. Um, so just to end this, this, uh, this teaching, I, I just wanted to pose a question to you guys. And then I'll share a little bit of testimony and then I'll open it up. So the question to think about is, have there been times in your life when God was clearly trying to get your attention? And if so, how did you respond? So in my own life, some of you might know, I did grow up in a Christian home, but for various reasons, I really wasn't as grounded in my faith as I should have been. So not only that, but there were certain life situations or circumstances that caused me to become very bitter against God. And, and really, I was just bitter against the whole world. I was bitter <laughs> against everyone around me. And I knew it was wrong, but I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't control it, and it got so bad that I thought I would be living the rest of my life with that bitterness. And the peak of all of this was when I, when I was in college, and I had just decided to, I don't know, essentially 
uh, mute the Holy Spirit's voice in my life and just do whatever it is I wanted to do. And, and I remember basically having a justification for all the sinful things I was doing. And I even felt like I deserved it because, you know, life had done me wrong. So, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to get whatever's mine. And when God, and, and when God, um, tried to get my attention, he did so and did, he did three things in relatively quick succession to try to get my attention. So first, while working at a hospital, I learned to, uh, go off protocol. These are things I shouldn't have done, but I learned to go off protocol and to use the blood from my blood draws, which was done with a needle, to do the blood glucose test. So by doing this, I didn't have to further annoy the patients with a, a finger stick uh, or a finger prick to get a drop of blood uh, from their finger. So one particular morning, I, I worked night shift, it was the end of the shift, I did this, but but in the process, the needle that I used from the blood draw actually pricked my own finger. And of course, I was freaking out. I, I took the cocktail from the hospital for cases like this, which, which was meant to prevent HIV. And I was living in fear for a couple of weeks, just wondering if I contracted anything. But it turned out I was okay. And the patient even assured me that he was clean. And yet, I did not return to God. And then not long after that, I got into a really bad car accident. My friend was driving the car and I was in the back seat without a seat belt. Uh, I was not buckled. And another car in front of us tried to do an illegal U-turn with their headlights off. And my friend didn't see them, so, so they crashed. The other car flipped right over us. And I remember my field of vision going black and white and everything just, just went slow motion uh, during, during the crash until we hit. And by God's grace, even though I was in the middle, I kind of leaned towards the side to catch myself. Uh, and because of that, I hit the, the front passenger seat and I did not go flying through the windshield. Um, and the, the, uh, the cars, both cars, they were totaled, but, but by God's grace, I was able to walk away without a scratch. And yet, I too did not return to God. And finally, uh, the last thing that happened was on the very last day of school, uh, that particular, particular year as we were moving out, a very heavy uh, dumbbell or weight it, it crushed my finger, my pinky finger, um, and the whole top part of my finger, the entire nail, everything turned black and eventually, you know, fell off. But the amazing thing is God restored it completely. You could never tell I damaged my finger. And yet, I still did not return to God. So it was just stubborn, just like the people of Israel. And looking back, I'm just like, I see clearly that God was trying to get my attention, but I was so stubborn. That, that I couldn't realize it or I chose not to listen or I didn't listen. And then finally, the summer before my senior year in college, that's when uh, God's, what I would call, God's ultimate judgment came upon my life. So the sinful life that I tried to hide, it came out into the light. It became public for all to see and for all to ridicule. And I'll never forget the, the first time I opened my Bible after that. I was literally in Luke chapter 12. And, and the second verse I read, because it's, it's verses 2 and 3, it says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the rooftops and, or housetops. And I was just like, wow, this, this is so relevant to my life. And, and what happened was I had lost the thing that I, I thought was most precious to me. And then I fell into a very deep, deep, clinical depression and in my depression and I was so hungry for for something to sustain me and thankfully I knew enough to go to God's word to sustain me I was reading scripture 24 7 I was listening to sermons I was just listening to music worship music and journaling um, again just just to stay alive and to sustain me and it was it was really like my own time of exile and time of captivity and and though I wasn't suicidal I honestly didn't want to live anymore, and I told God that if He wouldn't take my life, then what was left of my life would be His. And that was the turning point for me. The rest of my life was never the same after that. Um, I tell people all the time that I, I became very um, passionate about apologetics, about systematic theology, and all kinds of things later on, but it was confronting the depths of my own sin in my heart that helped me to see my need for God and, and caused me to, offic to officially and finally surrender my life to Him. So in time, you know, God healed me of my depression. He restored me to even more, way more than what I had lost. I didn't know all the good things He had in store for me. And, uh, and he, gave to me the joy he gave to me what I should have had before, but He gave to me the joy of my salvation. 
so with that, um, let me stop sharing and I will open it up for any comments, questions, or maybe if you're comfortable, maybe you have a testimony that you'd like to share based on anything we have discussed today. And as, as usual, no pressure. We can always end early, but I do, we always want to give people a chance to share something if you want to. Yeah, yeah, I didn't hear about that, but but it's a good example, as you pointed out, that you know we might think we can hide things, but man, God knows everything, and and everything has a consequence. It'll catch up to us eventually. Amen. Amen. I appreciate every word, brother. Um, definitely, by God's grace, uh, you know, as I, as I was reading this, the 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 way that it applied to my life, I just could not escape. As I was like, I, I think the Lord wants me to share a little bit of my testimony. So, so thank you for that. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, people like myself, and, and you know, I think if we're to be honest, sometimes we still do it today as believers. We sometimes we justify the things um, that we shouldn't be doing. Uh, but, but it is a testament to God's mercy and God's grace and God's love that He will even do these things to try to get our, our attention. He can just walk, write us off, but He doesn't do that. Um, so I'm just grateful that His love is perfect, that His love encompasses, as you pointed out, both both love but also justice, and, and through it all there is grace and forgiveness in, in a way that only God could do, uh, in a way that you know we don't even fully understand, and yet somehow we are recipients of that from this perfect and holy God. So I'm just grateful for that reminder. Thank you, brother. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jamil. I really appreciate that. And, and absolutely. Um, if if we are not careful, I think it is so easy to to let all those other things, which are not bad in and of themselves, but if we are not careful, they can easily become idols, and that's why the spiritual disciplines and and being and you know being consistent with them is very important. And then the last thing I just wanted to touch on is you t you talked about the reward system in heaven, and essentially it's the nature of the kingdom, and I, I always call it the the gospel of paradoxes or the or the kingdom of paradoxes because everything. It seems to be flipped over its head, but it makes sense if you truly understand what Jesus is saying. Yeah, Yeshi, great points. And I think of Romans 12 too, um, which says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And when I was in college, you know, after that, after that time I told you about that I went through depression, my friends and I started a ministry called Reset. And one of the reasons we did was because of that need to reset our minds because of how easy it is to drift away and to let the world and its cares and, and whatever other responsibilities just take us away. And again, I'll just keep focusing on even just spiritual disciplines, but not only that, but this is one of the reasons I'm grateful for even this group, this the Word, and doing this once a week. It's an opportunity to just stop in our you know, in our secular environment, as you said, and to be able to just refocus ourselves um, and, and rem remind ourselves who we are, why we are here, and that we are not alone, and that the Spirit is with us, and that the Spirit guides us, gives us strength, and gives us wisdom, even in the work environment, no matter what we do. So definitely grateful for that. I'm glad you're joining. I, I forgot that you're on the West Coast, so uh, kudos to you for joining first thing in the morning. Uh, but it's, it's always great to see you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that uh, contributes to the stubbornness, and, and if we just keep muting the Holy Spirit, we're, we're muting out the most important, the, the greatest wisdom and the most important thing in our lives. And I think about, I forget exactly which verse it is in the Bible, but there is a verse that essentially says we have it even better than in the Old Testament, the, the, the believers there, because, you know, the Spirit of God lives in us and we always have the Holy Spirit. So we pray to be filled by the Spirit, but this, as, as believers, we have the Spirit in us. And sometimes we don't appreciate the blessing that that is and how crazy that is, that the God of the universe lives in us. So, um, yeah, I appreciate everything. I definitely agree with everything you said, brother. Mm. Yeah, and, and Catherine, you know, that reminds me, I, I, those of you who have been here um, for a little long, you've probably heard me say this, but I love the way Tim Keller describes it, and essentially idolatry as being when good things become ultimate things. It's when all these good things eventually become like, I can't live without this. My life is destroyed without whatever this is, or I have no reason for living anymore. And of course, we're human. We have feelings and, and we have we love you know our families and things like that. But God should always be the ultimate sustainer of our lives and He should be the foundation in such a way. In Hebrews, it says, it is the only thing that, that can be an anchor to our soul and an anchor, which to me is like the anchor of our ship. When this, no matter what happens, no matter how bad the storm is, he is the only anchor that can keep us grounded no matter what. 
to, to have that fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, no matter what is going on in our lives. So that's just an amazing reminder right there. Yo, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, just sharing. I uh, appreciated all the comments, and, and I love it when uh, when everyone's able to contribute and share like that. So thank you all so much. I will uh, close in prayer, and then we can go about the rest of our days. <laughs> all right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we just want to just thank you for your perfect love. Thank you for your perfect justice. Thank you for your your grace, which is which is humbling and just so amazing and it's poured out over my life poured out over all, every single one of our lives and and thank you for the, the words from my brothers and sisters here thank you for the fact that you know we have we can overcome through the blood of the lamb and through the word of our testimony father so i pray father that every single day that you would just soften our hearts to be sensitive to the voice of your spirit may we not mute the voice of your spirit help us to be open to correction help us to love others especially the poor and the outcasts of society. Help us to be able to just live our lives for your kingdom every single second and every single day because you know this life in Christ, this life for you, should be all-encompassing, whether it's in our personal lives or whether it's here at work. Uh, so I just want to pray a special blessing over all my brothers and sisters on this call today and even those who couldn't make it, Father. Uh, Lord, man, I just pray that you would continue to bless this group uh, for for your glory, Lord, and so that we can continue to build each other as the body of Christ, Lord, and we can continue to encourage each other. So I, put, I pray, Lord, that um, you would bless the rest of our workday, the rest of our week. Once again, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.